I'm Anthony Kaysen, Vice President for Workforce Continuing Education at Wake Tech Community College. Black History Month is a very important time of the year. We should all take pride in celebrating the achievements of those who came before us and our ancestors and realize that we would not enjoy many of the freedoms that we do today without their great sacrifice and their many achievements in our history. As we think about going forward, Please reflect on black history and everything that has happened that has gotten us to today and understand how far we have to go. If you don't know your history, you will not know where you're going, which is so important this month and all throughout the year. Please remember, black history is American history and we should take the torch that was handed to us and carry it as far as we can go. Hand that torch off to our children and our grandchildren so that they can continue making black history and continue the strides that we have made in America today. Please remember, black history is American history. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Mike Ellis. I'm Dean of College and Career Readiness at Wake Tech Community College and I'm thrilled to share just a couple of minutes of why Black History Month is important to this old white guy. And it has to go back to where I was raised in Brookville, Ohio, which was at that time a completely WASP town. WASP, if you don't know, stands for White Anglo-Saxon Protestant. So I went to school. I was raised in a community. There were very few Catholics, no Jews, no people of color. Uh, everything was all white in my school. But when I left high school and went to Indiana University for my freshman year. It was there where I truly experienced diversity and new cultures. And I had my first guess who's coming to dinner experience my freshman year when I invited Walter Blake to come back home with me for Thanksgiving. See, Walter was from South Bend and he didn't have enough room in his house for all the family that was going to be there. And so I invited him to come with me. And I didn't think to tell my parents that Walter was black. But when he got out of the car, I could see kind of the shock and awe on their faces. But it turned out to be a great experience. Walter taught me that you have to be willing to put yourself in uncomfortable situations and stand up for what's right. And two of the individuals that I always taught about when I was covering the 100-year period between the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation and the walk on uh, the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom are Claudette Colvin and Bayard Rustin. See, Claudette was actually the first woman of color to get arrested for refusing to give up her seat on the bus in Montgomery, Alabama. It happened nine months before Rosa Parks, but Claudette was 15 uh, when her case started winding its way through the court system. She was pregnant and she was unmarried. Um, Dr. King and the people that worked with this Southern Christian Leadership Conference didn't think she would be the one they wanted to put in front of the public. And so they sought another opportunity and Rosa came along. But Claudette's case went all the way to Supreme Court and it was her case that actually ended up stopping uh, the Montgomery bus boycott because she won along with four other plaintiffs. And it was a remarkable feat of courage for her to stand up. The other one is Bayard Rustin, who worked with A. Randolph Smith, and uh, he also worked with Dr. King in planning the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. You see, Bayard, uh, in the 50s and the 60s, was already an openly gay black man, and for that time, he was so very courageous. Uh, he faced lots of obstacles, even within the groups that he was helping. He designed and he advertised many of the freedom marches, and people that walked on those freedom marches uh, oftentimes ridiculed Bayard, and it was just unfortunate. But these individuals who were not very well known and who uh, were ridiculed still did what was right. So I 
give thanks for Walter, for Claudette, and for Bayard. Booker T. Washington, born a slave, freed at the Emancipation Proclamation, ended up walking 500 miles to get an education, and ended up starting Tuskegee, which is located in Alabama. So he talked about economic independence, wealth accumulation, and starting businesses during a time when there was not necessarily stress. Now, keep this in mind. This is during the 19th century when a lot of black schools and businesses were being burned down at that time. So he was able to pull that off. What an incredible achievement that was. He's an inspiration of mine. If you want to know more about him, read his narrative up from slavery. Happy Black History Month. Peace. Hello, my name is Dr. Laverne Austin, and in celebration of Black History Month, I would like to share Mae Jemison. Mae Kara Jemison was born October the 17th, 1956. She is an American engineer, physician, and former NASA astronaut. She became the first African-American female to travel into space, where she served as a mission specialist aboard the Space Shuttle Endeavour. The Tuskegee Airmen were Black fighter pilots who helped serve our country during World War II. Even though they were under the segregation of Jim Crow at the time, they fought for a country that wasn't not fighting for them. Not only does this uh, historical group, but their last member died recently at the age of 101. Not only is this something that we can think about today, but it's something that we can view. This is a statue that is at scene at the North Carolina Museum of Art, which represents all the accomplishments of the Tuskegee Airmen. Happy BHM. Here's a little known black history fact about Garrett Morgan, the creator of the gas mask and the traffic light. Where will we be today without that traffic signal? Hmm. Still stuck in traffic. Senator Clemente Pinckney was an American politician and pastor who served in the South Carolina Senate. He was first elected to the South Carolina General Assembly in 1996 at the age of 23, becoming the youngest African American elected to the South Carolina State Legislature. As a senator, he pushed for laws to require police and law enforcement officials to wear body cameras. In June of 2015, Senator Pinckney was murdered in the Charleston Church shooting. As a result of the shooting, the South Carolina State Legislature enacted legislation to remove the Confederate flags from the South Carolina State House. Senator Clemente Pinckney. Hello, we'd like to tell you about Elizabeth Cotton. She was born in 1893 in Carborough, North Carolina, just down the road from here in Raleigh. She was left-handed, but she taught herself to play a right-handed guitar upside down, which became a very specific style of finger picking that became extremely influential in the American folk and blues music scene. So I'm very excited to tell you about Elizabeth Cotton. Look her up on YouTube. You can watch her play her guitar and sing. They just finished a mural for her in her hometown of Carborough. You can go see that too. Thank you very much for listening. Elizabeth yep. Cotton. Yep. Carter G. Woodson, father of black history. In 1926, he established Negro History Week during the second week of February to commemorate the birthdays of Republicans, Frederick Douglass and Abraham Lincoln. Woodson sought to create a forum that later became Black History Month. Dr. Carter G. Woodson. Fanny Jackson Coppin. In 1869, Miss Jackson Coppin became the first African-American woman in the United States to hold the title of head school principal. Not only did she teach Greek, Latin and mathematics, she encouraged the Institute to add an industrial training department. Ms. Jackson Coppin recognized the importance of vocational training as well as academic education. Happy Black History Month. Today I wanna to share with you my favorite fact about black history. In 1958, mathematician Mary Jackson became NASA's first black female engineer and in 2019, she won the Congressional Gold Medal. You can read or watch her story in the novel and film, Hidden Figures. Hey, good people. We're honoring BHM again. 
And in the words of Dr. Cornell West, justice is the expression of love in public. Peace, y'all. Hello, everyone. My name is Jeff Robinson, and I served at Wake Tech Community College as the Dean of Public Safety and the Chief Campus Officer at our Wake Tech Public Safety Education Campus. I'm just excited that you would even uh, spend any time hearing about and listening to my journey. My journey started in Albany, Georgia. Albany, Georgia is the southwest part of Georgia. And somewhere around eight or nine years old, I got um, exposed to really black history and how rich the history is to a young man by the name of A.C. Searles. Mr. A.C. Searles was the owner of the Southwest Georgian newspaper. And this newspaper went out throughout Southwest Georgia and it really tried to show a really diverse group of people trying to serve and help their community. I started selling that newspaper for probably two or three years. And then as I got older, I started working in different places in 85, I actually enlisted in the United States Marine Corps, where I then was really exposed to so many different types of people who were from all walks of life. And throughout this United States, they came to Paris Island. And then from there, in 1988, I found myself after the Marine Corps at one of the, what I call the greatest universities in the world, North Carolina Agriculture and State University. I started there as a student, but also I was there as a campus police officer, and that's where I started my career. Being at an HBCU and seeing uh, another group of diverse people who were engineers, uh, business majors, nursing majors, uh, educators, just a, a hodgepodge of uh, a lot of people coming together. What an awesome experience. Around 91, I decided to go to High Point Police Department, where again, I got exposed to High Point, somewhere around 80,000 people. And what I saw, the diversity I saw, was that it was based on what section of town um, you lived in. And so again, I have now an opportunity to serve because many of those communities reminded me of the community I lived in because I did grow up poor in Albany, Georgia. And so I tried to start helping out with uh, basketball, teaching life skills to anyone that would uh, listen, uh, being involved at the YMCA, uh, helping out in the community. And I also had a chance then to start working narcotics and working drugs, which uh, High Point is one of those source places for, uh, at that time, heroin. And so we just started working cases, trying to take the drugs off the street, because one of the things I found is, is that many of our the elderly were living in neighborhoods that 30, 40 or years ago were really nice neighborhood, but unfortunately because of drugs, they became uh, drug infested. So we, we were trying our best to help serve and remove the drugs from there. I then moved to the eastern part of North Carolina, to Greenville, North Carolina, working with the Pitt County Sheriff's Office, working in narcotics, doing some of those same things there. Uh, and then working at Pitt Community College. I started as an adjunct instructor and then came over to begin to train. And one of the areas I wanted to help train in is that uh, because I realized that we come from different backgrounds, that maybe that they would see um, more different type of ethnicities. And so we tried to make sure that in that training, they were exposed to different uh, people and different backgrounds. And then from there, uh, in May of 2013, I came to Wake Tech, which I'm so excited about Wake Tech. But at Wake Tech, I've been able to work now with different groups, with the YMCA again, with uh, Strive, with uh, Youth Thrive, just working it with different organizations trying to help serve. But the one that I really want to talk about is what happened last year throughout this pandemic with George Floyd, Ahmad, and Brianna. We began to uh, partner with the Wake Tech and uh, Department of Community College System, the North Carolina Community College System Office, and that was to uh, go out and partner with IAPS, Dr. Javini, and try to train trainers 
to uh, teach implicit, explicit bias, impartial policing, moral compass, and we're up to date. We're just excited as we went all around the region to teach over almost 200 people have been trained to go train in all 100 counties. And then we also decided that we need to, there are most of the time when we see these different incidents that there are some type of mental crisis that are going on. And we began to train officers and almost a hundred officers have been trained with de-escalation. And so I've just gone out and tried to be the best me and believe that uh, I can help and serve. Well, I really appreciate you for listening and hearing my story. Uh, you have an awesome day.